All right, good morning. No, I'm not gonna wake you up again. Jennifer has done a fantastic job of uh, kickstarting the show. Uh, my name is Arun Gupta. I'm a principal open source technologist at Amazon. Uh, I work in the open source team at Amazon. Uh, I'm also the Amazon's board representative for Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So as uh, Jennifer said, anything around um, containers and serverless, I'm responsible for the open source strategy part of it. Um, of the three rules, listen, learn, and share, uh, I'm gonna start with sharing part of it, and I'm gonna be here the rest of the day listening and learning from you guys, absolutely. So really excited about that. <clears throat> so um, I thought something I'll talk about today is Amazon's culture of innovation. Um, there are a lot of innovative companies. We are in the Bay Area, so there are definitely a lot of innovative companies. Um, but what I'm gonna share something is very peculiar about Amazon and how we innovate. This is a process that has worked for us, and we have been doing this for many years. So I'm gonna share those peculiar things from you with you. You can pick some of these, and if it doesn't work, listen to it as an interesting story and see how you can adapt it in your culture. Um, from our very humble beginnings of a bookstore, you know, when we were selling books many, many years ago, you know, we have grown where we have taken a problem and learned to how to adapt it to masses. Uh, now, whether it's um, selling, you know, into, uh, getting into e-commerce, whether it's selling devices like Echo, or whether it's taking something as intricate as um, um, data center technology and bringing it to the cloud. You know, the idea is to really take something which is fundamental uh, for customers and simplifying it, innovating it on their behalf. That's really the key part here. So we have really taken good, you know, we have really become good at this. And the whole idea is you make it so ubiquitous that it really enables innovation for others. So that's some of the share knowledge that I'm gonna share with you today on how we do this at Amazon. So I'm gonna start um, with a quote from Jeff Bezos, and let me read it for you. It says, invention comes in many forms and at many scales. The most radical and transformative of inventions are often those that empower others, note others, to unleash their creativity, to pursue their dreams. Now, a lot of the innovation that we do is driven by the fact on how we can empower others to innovate. That is really a fundamental aspect over here. Take a look at uh, Amazon Web Services. This is how it was started. The problem that we faced about 12, 13 years ago is Amazon was growing rapidly and we were not able to enough you know, set up our own data centers. And we realized if we are facing that problem, our customers would be facing the same problem as well. So we created Amazon Web Services to help our own self as well, but then you know, our customers really liked it as well, and that you know where AWS is today. Think about fulfillment by Amazon. That's another example where we already had the infrastructure set up on how the entire supply chain management needs to work. Now we are enabling our third party suppliers and we do the stocking, shipping, customer service management, all of that for our customers. Uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, again, you know, something that we have been doing, but enabling our customers to innovate on our behalf. Airbnb is a classic example. This is a company that was started by two people who were running short of money, and they wanted to generate enough cash to pay their rent. You know where Airbnb is today. I was reading uh, Economic Impact of Airbnb. Um, it's, you go to airbnb.com slash economic dash impact, and it says, 52% of Airbnb homeowners are low and moderate income. And 53% of Airbnb owners are using, are being an Airbnb host because it allows them to stay in their house. So it's not just about you know, innovation, it's about empowering others to make their life much more meaningful. Our mission at a very high level is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. It's a very broad statement. Um, what that means is it also can allow us to take many shapes, many forms, many sizes, the way we want to adapt it. Uh, the key part to notice here is we are not competition-driven. We don't talk about competition at all in that sense. We are absolutely customer-driven. And the main reason we do that is because if we are competition-driven, we have to really wait for the competition to do something and then react upon it. If being a customer-driven approach is hugely beneficial for us because 
customers are divinely discontented. They always keep telling us that this is what you need to do. And we love that part because that's one that we keep iterating again and again. And our mission is really rooted in our commitment. You know that we want to make our customers' lives easier. How many of you are prime customers? About 80% of you. And that's very typical. I've been a prime customer for several years myself, far before I joined Amazon. And the whole aspect that I can order something and I can get a delivery within two days, or I can get a delivery within a day, or sometimes even two hours. You know, the day I joined Amazon, my son wanted to do some baking at house. And we want to do baking, we don't want to get out of the house. Yeah, well, we'll try Prime now. We made an order, within two hours, all the goods that we needed for baking were delivered at the house. And at the very first day, my son had an aha moment that, oh, it's good to work for such a company, that I like your company. So, and I feel proud that, you know, I can shop online very easily and I can have access to that infrastructure. So let's talk about our four mental models on how we think about culture of innovation at Amazon. The first one, of course, is customer obsession. Anything that we do really starts with the customer and we work backwards from there. And we have a very specific process on how we do that, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. But anything that we have done at Amazon, 90 to 95% of our roadmap is truly driven by customers. We think what the customers would need, and we talk to the customers on what do they want, and then we strive to make those needs and wants meet in our product roadmaps, and that's essentially what it is. So for example, Amazon EKS, which is a managed Kubernetes service, is a want that our customers were asking us. None of our customers ever asked for Amazon Prime. That's the need. We realize that that needs to be fulfilled. So we look at both of those aspects on what needs to be done essentially. Um, now, Jeff Bezos says, you know, one of the things I love about customers is that they're divinely discontent. Their ambitions are never static. They always keep going up. And that's the whole aspect, and that's very human nature. And that's the biggest advantage of taking a customer-driven approach, because then we can always keep listening to customers and what do they want and keep innovating on their behalf. The second part of it is the long-term thinking. You know, we are always looking at what is it that we want to do in the long term. Our long-term goal is to be the most customer-centric company, which is what? Which is a vision. The details is how we do it. Whether we are selling CDs, diapers, um, on Amazon.com, you can buy a $175,000, 5.4 carat gold uh, uh, diamond ring, if you want to buy that. So there are all kind of things that can you know, make customers happy. Or you want to sell smart devices, or you want to do AWS, utility computing, whatever you want to do. So the vision is very clear. It's a long-term company, but the details on how we execute this can matter. And who knows where we get into it. It's very important that if you want to be able to innovate, be willing to fail. That's a very important aspect of it. Innovative mindset is completely okay with failure. And um, Jeff Bezos, in his uh, share letters to, uh, sh um, in a letter to shareholders, said, Amazon is the best place to fail. And you, know, if you want to experiment, experiment early, experiment often, be willing to fail, and then innovate, continue innovating. And the last part really is, you have to be willing to understood for a, misunderstood for a very long period of time. In 2006, Bloomberg wrote an article talking about, hey, this bookseller is making a bold and risky move of selling utility computing. And they were talking about AWS at that point of time. And here we are. So we are very much willing to be misunderstood. You know, when Amazon Kindle was launched, it was a big paperweight. People are like, this is not gonna work it was sold out rather quickly, and we'll talk about that. But the point being, let's be willing to misunderstood for a long period of time and continue to evolve from there. I also want to talk about Amazon's growth flywheel. The legend is that this was written by Jeff Bezos on a piece of napkin, which probably is sitting somewhere on Smithsonian right now, but we kind of put it on a PPT so that we can talk to you about this. The way we look at this is, uh, this is very fundamental to how we do product development at Amazon. We look at a customer experience. Let's go from an Amazon.com perspective. Now, instead of going to a bookshelf, the 
Amazon.com website gives you a unique search capability where I can just enter the name over there and I can see the books that need to be sold or any item for that matter that you want to buy over there. Because you provide a better customer experience, word of mouth, you get more traffic. Because you get more traffic, you can you know, invite more sellers to participate on your website. At first, when we started talking about that, hey, you know what? It's not just gonna be Amazon that's gonna be selling um, goods on Amazon.com, but we're gonna invite our competitors to sell goods on Amazon.com. Like people were blown away, like why would you do that? Two values, first is it gives choice to our customers, it gives selection to our customers. And second is it builds more traffic again to our website. Because at the end of the day, it's convenience for customers, they don't have to go anywhere else, they can buy it from Amazon.com itself. So this cycle kind of becomes a virtuous cycle which keeps feeding back because you have more selection, you have a better customer experience, and then you keep going in cycle. Now because of economies of scale, the way we are operating, we are also able to invest more into the R&D of our infrastructure and lower the cost of infrastructure. Now because we lower the cost of infrastructure, we can either keep the money in our pocket because the infrastructure is now costing us lower, or we can pass on the dividend to our shareholders. Instead, what we do is we lower our prices. Since the inception of AWS, we have lowered our prices 66 times, and no customers has ever complained for that, that hey, why did you lower the price? Because customers love it. And that's the whole mentality of a customer obsession on anything and everything that we do, essentially. Now, one of the things I want to highlight here also is Somebody uh, asked Jeff Bezos that, where do you think the industry will be in 10 years and how will, how will it evolve? He says, I don't know how the industry will evolve, but the key thing to remember is value, selection, and convenience are three things that people will still want. And a classic example of that is Amazon Prime. We started Amazon Prime back in 2007 only with free premium shipping. Okay, that was the only value proposition. Over a period of time, you know, new choices were offered, then there is a prime video, then there is a prime music, then there is prime pantry. Um, so constantly, as you can see, the value, the selection, the convenience of watching a movie right from your own screen itself is super easy. And it's for the same membership price that you get for the prime anyway. So overall, prime is a very classic example of how, how that virtuous cycle has worked with value selection and convenience. Um, the another part of this is, you know, if you think about this, the economies of scale, how we are passing all the benefits to the customers that you're paying that Amazon Prime is not just shipping anymore. You, know, you get a lot of other benefits. And the second thing is the network effect that it causes essentially by which, you know, friends tell other friends that, hey, I'm, I love this Prime functionality and you should try this too. So now, how do we organize for innovation essentially? So, you know, People talk about it, yeah, that innovation is cool, but if I were to kind of look at it from my organizational perspective, what do I do? So there are four aspects to this essentially, uh, mechanisms, architecture, culture, and organization. So let me talk about them. So mechanisms is basically, um, in most companies, business parlance is also called as business processes. And we don't like to call them as business processes, we call them as mechanisms, because mechanisms is a closed loop process. So essentially what you do is, you know, you create a process, you build a tool, you drive the adoption of the tool, you get feedback about the tool, and then it feeds back into improving the tool. It's a constant cycle where we're constantly evolving on how the tool is listening to customers, constantly. The hallmark mechanism for all product development on the way we apply these processes is um, something called as working backwards process. This is the fundamental way we do product development at all across Amazon. Anything and everything ever built at Amazon has gone through this process. And the key part really here is we start from a customer. Okay, now as I said, 90 to 95% roadmap is driven by customer. So there's got to be a customer need or a want that we need to start with. Once we have identified who the customer is, then we write a press release, a PR. This is even before a single line of code is written. And in the press release, we say, 
What is the customer delight that we are offering? What is the customer pain point that we are solving? There is a quote from an Amazon exec. There is a quote from a customer exec. It's a lot of crafting. It's a lot of hard work that you need to go through to create this press release. But the idea is, what is the value that everybody else in the world is going to see when this product is going to be ready? So you create a press release to begin with. There's a very well-defined format for this within Amazon. And then along with the PR, you also have a FAQ, which is a frequently asked questions. What is the pricing? What do, how does it matter? How is it going to scale? How is it going to upgrade? How is it going to integrate with other technologies? So there's a full detail um, FAQ. We call these documents as six-page narratives. I'm in the middle of writing one, and I pretty much review several every week as well from different product teams. But that's pretty much how all of the product development is done at Amazon. And then we even have a user manual ready. And by the way, all of this is before a single line of code is written for any service. And that's a fundamental requirement. We make sure the key stakeholders across Amazon are involved. They're giving feedback on this. We always tell people, think of PRFAQ as a pinata. The harder you hit, the faster the good things come out. One of the classic examples I'll talk about PRFAQ is um, about 12 years ago, um, Andy Jesse, who's the CEO of AWS now, he felt the need that, hey, you know what? This provisioning hardware infrastructure for um, Amazon is not working out. We need to have a self-service model for this. So he literally wrote a PRFAQ and hey, we should start something called as Amazon Web Services. Did through 30, 40 iterations, and there we go. This is 12 years later. He's still running the show of AWS very strong. The most important part of PRFAQ is you start with the customer. Who is your customer? <clears throat> In this case, for example, if I look at this lady on the bottom left, she is going through a bus. She may not want to interact with voice. She may be go to going through a part of the town where there is not enough connectivity. She may have a touch device only. So you need to think about that part of it. If you think about where is your program or your service or your product going to be accessible, does that part of the world have good internet connectivity? How is it going to work in an offline mode part of it? Um, I was reading a PRFQ of Echo, um, and it says our top design objective was for Kindle, or actually for Kindle, our top design objective for Kindle was to disappear in your hands so that you can just enjoy the reading. And when Amazon Kindle was introduced, it was sold out in five and a half hours. This is a while back. Yes, Kindle itself has evolved quite a bit, but that's sort of the nature of what products, the way we are built. The five key questions that we typically try to address in a PR FAQ are here, uh, who is the customer? That is the most important part. You've got to be empathetic with the customer, understand their needs and wants, what do they want really to be addressed over there. Um, what is the customer problem or opportunity that you're trying to solve over here? What is the customer delight that you're trying to create over here? That's a key, key requirement over here. Is the most important benefit clear? You, know, you need to have qualitative and quantitative data. I have talked to this, 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 this customer, and that's why we are able to build this service. That's why they are asking, here is the performance improvement. Here is the key feature that matters to them. How do you know what customers want and need? That's the important part of it. It really allows you to focus that, you know, are you really building this for the fun of it, or are there customers' needs and wants that are being fulfilled over here? And then finally, we may have some appendices which would say, oh, this is how the customer experience would look like. They would touch here, and they would swipe here, or they would go to this console. And so there would be some diagrams or appendices in the overall PRFQ. So that's, again, a hallmark way on how we do product development. Now, the second aspect is really the architecture. So once we have the processes, um, architecture is a toolbox uh, that we give um, on how we create uh, those products. Now, we need to give a common structure, you know, which is without gatekeepers, which is fully self-service that the employees within Amazon can adapt to, and they can easily get started. So if you think about AWS, you know, we have 120 plus services. Um, anybody you know, in Amazon can just, or around the world as a matter of fact, can use their credit card, start using those services, 
There is no need to go to your IT department and saying, provision me this server or download this database. The service is just running right in the cloud itself, fully managed for you. You want to go global, you want to go regional, whatever you want to do. We have you know, 18 regions, 55 availability zones, really gives you that global scale. Take an example of code.org. When they were launched um, like a few years ago, their initial plan was to launch only in US. A Couple of weeks before the launch, the plans changed. They said, we want to go global. And the reason they could easily go global is because they uh, took the exact same code and deployed it in other regions and availability zones around the world. So that's sort of the whole aspect of you know, self-service aspect without gatekeepers at all. Now, if, let's go back to the example of Airbnb. Up until two years ago, now Airbnb has far more rooms and hotels and chains than Marriott and several other bigger brands. And their entire IT infrastructure, because the company has grown up on AWS, is managed by five people. That's all they had up until two years ago. Another classic example is uh, Amazon Connect. Um, one of the global uh, uh, company reached out to Andy Jesse that, how do you do call center for Amazon? So we looked at our call center products and we said, okay, we're gonna create something called as Amazon Connect. So you can now go to Amazon and you can say, I wanna set up a call center, go to Amazon Connect, that's a service, and everything is pre-provisioned for you. So again, the aspect is self-service without gatekeepers so you can continue to innovate on your customer's behalf. This, this diagram is definitely about AWS, but the key part here is how, if you want, you can just use one service, or if you want, you can integrate these multiple services together to create a nice solution for you. So that's the whole aspect over here. Now, the third aspect is culture. Uh, this is where we talk about you know, sort of the people and our beliefs come into play. Amazon uh, hires builders. Um, that's a very important aspect of how do we do hiring. And by builders, are, we mean the people who look at customers' problem and they understand their pain point and they are willing to innovate on top of them. Who understand that launch is not the starting, is just a starting line. That means from there, the work has started. Now they need to listen to customer feedback. Now they need to continuously integrate and evaluate and see how the product is going to evolve. That's the very critical part of all we do. Anything that we have ever done at Amazon has not been a success on day one, but what we have been constantly doing is customer obsession. Listening to customers and continuously evolving based upon that, and that's what has led us over here. You have to keep iterating and listening to customers to make the product and make it successful for them. Now, this is something that is very, very inherent about uh, Amazon, what we call as Amazon leadership principles. Some of you may know about it already. Typically, if you walk into a company and you say, what is your vision, what is your mission? Like, I, I don't know what it is, but I can bet you, if you walk into any Amazon building, any Amazon building, ask them what the leadership principles are. There are 14 of these. I can bet you anybody can easily tell you 10 of these. And the reason is because this is something that everybody at Amazon connects on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's very important because essentially the way we hire, the way we recognize people, the way we promote people is exactly based upon this. On any given day when I'm writing emails, I don't know, I use a bunch of these leadership principles when I'm giving references. In my PRFAQs that I write or I review, I'm constantly quoting these leadership examples, principles. The first one is uh, definitely the fundamental one, which is customer obsession, where it says uh, leaders, and by leaders I don't really mean the executive leaders or directors in that sense, everybody at Amazon is considered as a leader, and it says every, uh, leaders start with customers and work backwards. So I would recommend searching for Amazon leadership principles, reading more about them. Originally, when the company started, we had five of those, but we have grown up these leadership principles, and now there are about 14 leadership principles. Um, I don't have my badge right now, it's in my bag, but I have a small card attached to my badge which talks about those leadership principles. I want to be constantly reminded because I truly connect with these leadership principles myself. There's a concept of when we interview people, 
you know, this is how interviews are done, essentially. I'm not sharing a secret here. Um, there is a loop, and in the loop there are many, many people. Everybody is given a leadership principle that you're going to inquire, you're going to deep dive a particular candidate on that leadership principle. So make sure you read up those leadership principles very well. So now we have mechanisms, we have tool sets, uh, we have the people that do innovation or operate innovation. We need to make sure that there are right organizational ethos and set up to innovate. So what we want to do is we want to enable team to prototype and iterate a lot. Uh, you, we want you to experiment early. We want you to experiment a lot. It's completely okay to fail. You know, and Amazon had, and as Jeff Bezos said, that Amazon is the best place to fail. We have had a lot of failures. Think about Fire Phone. Think about Wallet. Think about Destinations. There have been several failures for Amazon, but you know, we learn from those and apply those learnings to other products. Whatever team was working on Fire Phone, we had to incur a $170 million loss on that, but that team then got hired back, and that experience was utilized what is now known as Echo Device, or Alexa. Now, the way we are able to take action quickly is we have a very specific way of doing this. We make a fundamental decision about the type of decision that we want to make. We have this concept of a one-way or a two-way door. One-way door is where you can walk into a room, the door is closed, you cannot walk out of it. Two-way door is, you walk into the room, and if you don't like that room, you can walk out of the door. And these are very important decisions. You know, one-way door, one doors have significant um, and irrevocable, irrevocable um, consequences. Two-way door, on the other side, um, have limited and reversible consequences. Most of the time, organizations would do a one-size-fit-all kind of decision, They'll make everything as a one-way door decision, and they'll spend a lot of time going through those, that decision-making process. And the problem with that is it reduces experimentation, it increases unthoughtful risk aversion, and it slows down innovation. So you constantly have to think about it. That you know, I'm spending so much time making a decision over here. Is it a one-way or a two-way door? Make a quick call, and if it's a two-way door, we can back out of it right away. One of the last pieces of how do we set up the organizational structure, which is, you know, some of you may know about this, the two pizza team structure. And the idea is, well, it could be American pizza or a European pizza, and the team sizes could differ. But the idea is uh, a team is typically eight to 10 people. And the reason we set up that organizational boundary is because within eight to 10 people, we want to make sure the team is self-contained. And there are no external communications. Yes, there are external communications, but most of the time, when the team wants to deliver, we want to have a single-threaded discussion within the team itself. Uh, these are all decentralized teams that are talking to each other using well-defined APIs. They are self-directed. They own completely what they build. They're responsible for the delivery of it. They're responsible for the ops part of it. And that's the whole aspect. And that really allows us to give full autonomy of the product or the feature or the service that we have built. So these are basically four aspects on how we organize for innovation, essentially. And really, um, we move it to the edge. So the idea is, on, by applying mechanisms, architecture, culture, organization, we are enabling our customers to innovate for us. To so take an example of Novartis. Novartis is a global healthcare company. In 2013, they wanted to run um, Cancer, they wanted to run um, a screen 10 million compounds against cancer in less than a week. They realized if they were to run that test internally, it would take them 50, uh, well, um, 50,000 cores. It will take them about $40 million to run it in-house. Instead, they use AWS high-performance computing, and they did this in a little over $4,000. And they found three successful compounds. So that's what we call as innovation at the edge, enabling innovation for others. So that's an inherent part on anything that we are doing at Amazon is you know, we're pushing towards it. Uh, we are a nerdy company, so we like to say, what is our formula for how do we do innovate? So we're really looking at mechanisms and architecture that are in the company, and they're really amplified by the culture and the organization. We really put a lot of emphasis on the leadership principles 
everything and anything that we do you know, is like about leadership principles. What is the example that you're demonstrating over there? And that's a very common aspect that we look at it here. So feel free to talk to me about this. Um, I want to conclude by you know, how we look at you know, um, uh, Amazon in general. Um, There's a quote by Jeff Bezos which says, we had three big ideas at Amazon that stuck with us for 20 plus years, customer obsession. And again, I want to highlight, it is really an OCD on customers. It's all about customers first. Uh, continues, continue to invent on customer's behalf, and then be patient, be willing to be misunderstood for a long period of time. Uh, I'm going to be here for the rest of the day. If you have any questions, feel free to come by and talk to me. Thank you.